Hello, welcome to today's presentation on the emergent ostomy presented by the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons. The learning objectives for today's talk include characteristics of colostomies versus small bowel ostomies, stoma configurations, principles of stoma site selection, care of the ischemic stoma, and techniques to facilitate stoma creation in difficult situations. One of the first decisions to make in the emergency situation is deciding between a small bowel stoma versus a large bowel stoma. Small bowel ostomies have the disadvantages that liquid output can be more difficult to manage, and the more proximal the stoma is, the more effects this will have on the patient's nutrition and hydration. However, small bowel ostomies tend to have a rich blood supply and are less prone to ischemia. They can also be easier to reverse if this stoma is intended to be temporary. When creating a colostomy, the portion of the colon selected affects the characteristics of the stoma and its output. The preference is always the sigmoid or descending colon. The sigmoid is highly mobile, so usually pretty easy to pull up. Because the majority of the colon is still functional, sigmoid colostomies tend to create formed stool, which is easier for pouching, and these are generally very well tolerated for patients. If the left side of the colon is not accessible or not an option, the transverse colon can also be used to make a colostomy. It is easy to access as it's peritonealized and fairly mobile. The transverse colon does have a higher incidence of stomal prolapse. It also creates a higher output that's more liquid in nature and more malodorous. And it's also close to the rib cage. So there are multiple reasons where transverse colostomies can create pouching issues to the patient and can be lifestyle limiting. Ascending colostomies are not done that often because they have high output that's malodorous because it's colon, but also liquid because of how proximal they are. And there's really no benefit when comparing an ascending colostomy to a small bowel stoma. The next decision is stoma configuration. Configurations of stomas include loop, end, or variations of end loop stomas. Loop stomas are great because they're resistant to ischemia as you don't need to divide any mesentery, but the mesentery can also create tethering or reach issues depending on the patient's body habitus. Loop stomas are much less invasive to reverse as the anastomosis can be performed through a local dissection instead of a major laparotomy. And these configurations are really great to protect a distal anastomosis in a patient who physiologically cannot tolerate a leak or to divert a distal disease process in a patient who is unamenable to resection. An end stoma configuration can provide less tension and more reach for a patient with a shortened mesentery. However, a reversal can be more technically challenging as it would require abdominal exploration. End stomas are a good option for patients who have other factors that preclude a safe anastomosis. These factors can include hemodynamic instability, malnutrition, or immunosuppression. An end loop stoma is another option, which can be performed in two different ways. One is creating an end stoma with the mucous fistula of the distal limb, or you can staple off the distal limb and create almost a J configuration that can allow for further reach if a true end stoma is unable to reach without tension. Another important decision is stoma site selection. If an enterostomal therapist is available preoperatively, that's always a great option, but that isn't always the case in the emergency situation. You do want to account for patient factors, such as their body habitus, skin folds, contours, scars, bony prominences, or where they wear their waistband. I personally like to mark all skin folds with indelible ink while the patient is awake, but again, that's not always an option and might not be apparent if the patient is distended. If the patient is expected to care for their own stoma, it should be in a location where the patient can see it. A good rule of thumb is to place a stoma within the stoma triangle, which is formed by the anterior superior iliac spine, pubic tubercle, and umbilicus. The stoma should go through the rectus muscle to help prevent stoma prolapse, and you want a good two inch perimeter of skin around the stoma site to enable for good adherence of the face plate. In obese patients, an upper location of the stoma can be more helpful because this area of skin tends to be thinner 
and less prone to gravitational shifts with the weight of the panis. An upper abdominal location can also be easier to see for the elderly or again obese patients where the protrusion of their abdomen may preclude visualization of a stoma in the lower abdomen. As we all know, emergency surgery is more associated with postoperative complications and emergency stomas are no exception to this rule. Stoma ischemia is most commonly caused by arterial insufficiency or strangulation, but can also be caused by venous outflow obstruction if the fascial aperture is too tight. This is best avoided at the time of surgery by judicious assessment of bowel perfusion. You can check the mesenteric pulses, look for pulsatile bleeding from the cut edge of the mesentery during mobilization, pulsatile bleeding from the cut edge of the bowel wall, and by mucosal evaluation at the time of stoma creation. If any concerns develop postoperatively, it's important to identify the proximal extent of necrosis. One simple bedside examination technique is the test tube exam, where you take a test tube from uh, blood draws, uh, use some lubricant, and insert it into the stoma, and with a flashlight you can assess the extent of necrosis. If the necrosis is external to the fascia, this will usually slough and might cause stoma retraction, but will not create a life-threatening emergency. If there's necrosis below the level of the fascia, this will require revision as this could lead to perforation and ischemia and abdominal catastrophe. Up to this point, we've discussed preoperative and postoperative assessment of the stoma, but when you're in the OR and you just can't get it to reach, what are some maneuvers that can be helpful? One we've already discussed, which is placing the stoma at the supra-umbilical abdominal wall. Again, the fat in this area tends to be thinner and can minimize tension. It's easier for the patient to visualize, and it's less prone to positional changes based on the patient's weight of their abdominal wall. Scoring the peritoneal surface of the mesentery, either on one or both sides, can help provide an additional two to three centimeters of reach, and you do want to stagger these incisions if you are scoring both sides of the mesentery. A loop end is another configuration that can help allow for additional reach compared to a loop or a pure end stoma in the setting of a foreshortened mesentery. That can be pictured on the top right image. Or defatting of the colon for a colostomy can help reduce ischemia or the need to extend the size of the fascial aperture. In a patient with a distal obstruction who truly requires diversion, an end loop colostomy is another option if a true loop colostomy won't reach. In this scenario, the proximal colon is matured as an end colostomy and a portion of the distal colon is opened as a mucous fistula through the same aperture. These can actually be easier to pouch for patients compared to a true loop colostomy because the stoma size is reduced. Unfortunately, the ideal stoma in the ideal location isn't always an option. A poor stoma in a good location is generally easier for patients to care for. Factors like thickened bowel and mesentery may prohibit good eversion and maturation. An option in this scenario is to secure the stoma above the skin level without formal maturation, and once the patient recovers, they may be amenable to local revision or even reversal. Some patients have a hostile abdomen where you can't clear an ideal location. In this scenario, an option is to deliver the stoma and mature it through the midline incision. It's not ideal, but still saves their life. And in other patients, you may have good reach of the stoma, but the heavy mesentery puts too much weight and tension on it. In this situation, you have some options that can help support the stoma which is to use some stoma rods, or you can even tunnel a thin chest tube, red rubber, or vascular tunneler uh, through the abdominal wall to help support the mesentery at the level of the fascia. This concludes our presentation on the emergent stoma. Hopefully now you're more familiar with multiple types of stomas and configurations, principles of stoma siting, and techniques to help ensure adequate blood supply. In the emergency situation, you don't always have time to look it up in a book or you might not have help available, so it's good to have some tricks in your back pocket. And remember, each new stoma 
could be permanent. So these little tips and tricks can help maximize the patient's quality of life and prevent morbidity for your patients and maybe help you get a little more sleep at night. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation.